Okay, I think we're ready to start. Hey everyone, this is Elad from Astrolabe.Gnostics. I'm joined today by Adib Rahman, an associate professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and the technology director at the Human Immune Monitoring Center there. And I'm very excited to tell you about the heavy metal labeled varicells, which are now available from Biolegend, and the um, tools that Astrolabe offers to integrate these as quality controls with side of experiments. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please use the Q&A button below. Just click on it and enter your question. And once we're done with the, um, with the main content, then um, Adib and I are going to answer uh, the questions there. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Adib. Thanks a lot. Uh, so before getting started, uh, I did want to disclose that the, the metal label varicells, um, which are the subject of today's talk, uh, were actually developed as a collaboration with Mount Sinai, uh, and I'm a named inventor of the patent, and both Sinai and um, myself have received uh, payments associated with the licensing of the technology to BioLegend. All right. So, uh, as I'm sure is probably familiar to this audience, uh, mass cytometry is a powerful tool for being able to analyze complex biological samples and really resolve their single cell heterogeneity. Um, and this is, of course, a useful strategy when applied to large patient cohorts to be able to take, you know, a single sample here, for example, just a whole blood sample, resolve um, a range of different immune cell populations, uh, as well as their uh, associated marker expression patterns. Uh, and then evaluate this across multiple different samples to be able to see either how cell populations vary in their frequency. So in this case, uh, we're comparing longitudinal samples collected either during acute infection or uh, at recovery. And you can see the plasma cytokine and dendritic cells go down in frequency, uh, dendritic cells uh, go up. Uh, and we can also look at relative marker expression levels. So here, for example, we're seeing that the median intensity of CD40 uh, is elevated on the on CD14 monocytes at the acute phase of infection. So these are sorts of the, the kinds of studies that, that many folks are engaging with um, using mass cytometry, and it's well suited to do these sorts of analyses. But an important uh, caveat when, when considering this is that there are many sources of variability in cytometry experiments. Uh, so for example, there's uh, the instrument can contribute levels of variability. Uh, there's variations in the antibodies that are used from from day to day uh, in staining protocols or simply the volume of antibodies being pipetted on a given day. There can be sample matrix effects when dealing with whole blood. So, for example, compounds in a given individual's plasma uh, that may be impacting staining quality. And the last thing, there's actually true biological variation between samples. So what we mostly care about is this last point here, the true biological variation. Um, that's kind of what we're attempting to get at. Uh, and the challenge with these first four things is they all contribute to technical variation. And, and this technical variation can lead to type 1 and type 2 statistical errors, so you know, false positives, false negatives. And ultimately, these are the kinds of things we want to minimize so that we can really focus on that true biological variation. And so there's a, a number of strategies that can be used uh, to do this. Um, so one important thing that I'm sure most current mass cytometry users are familiar with are uh, the EQ beads from Fluidine. So these are beads that are doped with known amounts uh, of specific metals, uh, cerium, europium, almium, and cesium. And uh, you take these beads and you can spike them into samples prior to acquiring your data. Um, and so that way these beads are acquired simultaneously with your cells. And this is very helpful for performing sort of initial QC uh, because you can look at the, the signal intensity of the beads in comparison to a known reference standard. You can ensure that, that the signal is being maintained um, at an adequate level of sensitivity. You can evaluate CV, uh, look for things like oxide formation. Um, and so all of this is very useful for doing, doing some initial QC to ensure that the instrument was working properly during acquisition. And furthermore, you can also use these beats to then standardize your data to help account for those differences uh, that may have occurred. Um, so for example, if you have multiple different instruments that have different levels of sensitivity, uh, or if you have an instrument that over time is, is showing different levels of sensitivity, uh, you can use the variations in signal intensity of the beads to normalize for the, the signal intensity of your biological sample. Uh, so this is fairly standard, I think, uh, practice in, in the mass cytometry field at this point. But it's important to realize that the beads are really only um, normalizing for instrument variation. Uh, 
So many other sorts of variations, such as variations in your antibodies or staining, um, those really aren't addressable by, uh, by the normalization beads. And so these still remain kind of outstanding and, and significant factors that can impact uh, your conclusions. So one way to address some of those factors is to barcode samples. So barcoding is a very useful strategy and widely adopted in the mass cytometry field. Uh, the general premise is that you have uh, some set of isotopes that you allocate towards barcoding. Um, here I'm showing an HLA-based barcoding strategy, for example, where individual samples are stained with uh, antibodies um, that target a ubiquitous cell surface marker or um, small molecules that bind not specifically to the ubiquitous proteins on those cells, but essentially such that every antibody gets its sort of unique um, metal code. Those samples can then be pulled together uh, and run as a single sample, and then computationally you can deconvolve which cells came from which sample at the end of your analysis. And so this is a, a very powerful approach. I strongly recommend it for anybody doing mass cytometry because um, it really helps to reduce your experimental variability within batches of samples because uh, by, by pooling these samples prior to performing your staining, uh, all the samples in a given acquisition batch are, are exposed to sort of the same antibody cocktail, the same mixture of antibodies, uh, and the same sort of matrix effect. Um, it also helps to increase throughput, reduce costs, and also helps to facilitate double exclusion, which is, a, I think, a particularly useful attribute, but not something I'm really focusing on today. Um, so while barcoding, I think, is very useful, the challenge is that, you know, realistically, there's only a certain number of samples that can be feasibly barcoded together for a given acquisition pool. Uh, so the, flu the commercial fluid ion barcoding kits, uh, the palladium barcoding kits let you pool up to 20 samples together. Um, you know, there's in-house strategies one could use that will allow you to, to also pool some more samples with that. Um, but, you know, if you have a, a longitudinal study that has, you know, samples being collected over time or studies with, you know, several hundred samples, it's unlikely you're going to be able to barcode those all, all into a single batch. And so we still need some way of being able to control for variability that may be in control, uh, occurring between uh, distinct sample batches. And so uh, one strategy to address that is to use a barcoded bulk reference sample. So rather than barcoding multiple biological samples and pulling them together, the idea here instead is that you have a fixed reference sample uh, that has some sort of a barcode on it. Um, and this barcoded reference sample can now be spiked into your biological samples uh, as an internal reference. Um, and because that barcoded reference sample is, is sort of uh, kind of a known standard, you can analyze that known standard in parallel to your unknown biological sample. So this is very much kind of the analogous idea to the, to the EQ normalization beads, the primary distinction being that these are um, samples that are added to the, um, or it's a reference that's added to your samples prior to staining rather than prior to data acquisition and allows you to control for the, you know, the variability that may occur during that staining process. And so there's a bunch of different things that one could uh, hypothetically use as a, as a barcoded reference sample. Um, but the key attribute, it has to be something that has known expression values of relevant proteins um, that are you know, essentially relevant to your biological sample. Uh, you, you need to be able to spike it into your experimental sample and resolve it from that experimental sample. Um, and so, you know, one option is we could, we could try and use the same strategy as the EQ beads and use some sort of a custom bead formulation. But instead of having known amounts of metal, the beads could have known amounts of protein on them. Uh, I think that would be a super cool thing to have. As far as I know, it, it doesn't exist. Um, so another alternative is to use uh, a biological sample. So uh, one strategy is to use a cryopreserved cell standard, for example, uh, just taking a Buffy coat, uh, making a whole bunch of aliquots of that Buffy coat, um, and then using that. That's a, a good strategy and one that I, I recommend. The only limitation there is it makes it a little bit challenging if trying to do this in the setting of uh, large center studies, for example, or multi-site studies, where distributing those frozen aliquots can potentially, uh, can potentially be a challenge um, but it's nevertheless, I think, one that, that works fairly well. The uh, advantage of having a commercial source is it makes it easier for multiple labs to be able to, to essentially use the same reference standard across their studies, and it also helps with um, doing studies for a long period of time where you can have some assurance of, of batch control, for example, or large-scale production to ensure that you can buy uh, an aliquot several months from now and ensure that that reference is the same as the one that you're using today. So as far as, as uh, commercial standards go, there's a few options available. Um, so for example, there's culture cytotrol, uh, NIST Lyophilus CBMCs, and, and Biolege and Vericel. So all of these are flavors of lyophilized cells. Um, I've done some work with, with all of them. The, the Biolege and Vericel are the ones that we focused on the most. Uh, 
uh, partly because they really do recapitulate the phenotype of, of normal TVMCs quite well. So here's an example of an aliquot of uh, varicells stained with kind of a fairly generic uh, immune phenotyping panel. You can see uh, in the center here a bunch of TC plots showing uh, distributions of some of these major populations, and that's enough to be able to resolve several kind of canonical immune cell subsets, as you can see in this TC plot on the right. Um, and so overall, these things show a reasonable amount of biological complexity and, and show expression of many proteins that are sort of relevant to the kinds of proteins that we, we normally want to measure in our normal immune monitoring studies. Uh, an important note to realize is that these are um, fixed cells. So the, as part of that lyophilization process, uh, there is a fixation. So there, there are certain epitopes that are going to be fixation sensitive uh, that aren't going to work on these cells. And so they, they resemble formaldehyde fixed PBMCs more than they do uh, normal um, kind of conventional fresh PBMCs. Um, so in addition to having these, these fairly uh, standardized um, or fairly uh, robust staining patterns, an important attribute of any sort of reference sample is you want it to be reproducible. Uh, essentially, you want it to be consistent from day to day. And another nice attribute of the varicells is that that certainly does appear to be the case. So here, what we've done is we've taken um, multiple independent vials of varicells, uh, and we've stained them uh, across, um, across multiple different weeks. So essentially, on each day, we stained four to five independent vials of varicells, um, and we did it at week zero, uh, again two weeks later, and again six weeks after that. Uh, and what you can see in the center plot here is the relative frequency of these, these major subsets um, across time. Uh, the error bars are, are present, but actually quite small, so it's kind of hard to see. So our, our overall CVs, even for our rarest populations, are, are typically under 10%. Uh, and on the right here is a JS divergence plot. So if you were to run a TSNE on uh, each of these samples and then compare the relative amount of variation across those different TSNE plots, um, that's kind of what's shown in this little heat map here. And kind of the take home there is that the staining, in addition to the sort of the cell frequencies remaining very consistent, the overall staining expression patterns also remain very consistent. So these do work quite well as a as kind of a standardized reference that can be compared to uh, across time. Um, and then one sort of addition to the conventional varicells, which is kind of what we're talking about a little bit in this talk here, is this new product that's just been released from Biologen, which are these uh, heavy metal tantalum uh, varicells. So this is sort of a Cytoff specific um, form of varicells that have an intrinsic tantalum label in them. Um, and so you can see in this plot over here, we've taken some of these varicells and spiked them into a biological reference sample, and we, we barcoded them with CD45, uh, 175LU, uh, before doing so. And you can see that the tantalum label there on the x-axis gives you kind of comparable resolution to a fairly bright CD45 label uh, on the y-axis. Um, and so this is a nice advantage because uh, for two reasons. One, it means that Essentially, these cells are, are directly labeled uh, out of the vial, so you don't actually have to worry about staining them. Uh, you can kind of reconstitute a vial and spike them directly into your PBMC sample uh, and, and be confident that you can resolve them. Uh, and it's also nice because tantalum is a metal, you know, while it's well within the detection range of the Cytoff, it's generally not commonly used for other, uh, other analytes, um, as far as I know. And so it's a way to be able to effectively add a barcoding channel to this reference sample that doesn't compromise a channel that you might otherwise want to use for, uh, for phenotyping, uh, which is the challenge when doing things like a CD45 barcode, for example. Um, so we've done a bunch of testing to ensure that the tantalum labeling uh, works. So um, here you can see we've taken those tantalum labeled varicells, spiked them into PBMCs, and then just let that mixture sit for up to two weeks. Uh, and even, even for up to two weeks, the, the resolution of tantalum in the tantalum label of aerosols remains fairly robust. Uh, we don't see any sort of bleed over of that signal into the, the PBMCs in that sample. Um, and similarly, if we, if we take this sort of mixture and we subject it to a range of different permeabilization conditions, um, the, the label appears to be robust to, to that fixation and permeabilization as well. So you can see uh, cells in, in just stored in CSM here uh, on the left. Uh, for three days, either in BD Cytofix, Cytoperm, uh, eBioscience, uh, FOXP3, Permwash, uh, or in methanol. Uh, and in each of these cases, the, uh, for at least up to three days, the, um, the tantalum label is, is clearly well resolved from the, um, the biological sample. Um, such as the, the label actually works, and importantly, the, you know, broadly speaking, these tantalum labeled varicells look much like conventional varicells. So the tantalum labeling doesn't seem to compromise the kind of expected marker expression profile for these for these cells. Uh, 
Um, so here you can, you can see that we can identify most of those major cell populations. The relative marker expression patterns across those cell populations seem to be fairly consistent for the two cell types. Uh, and so this is for a relatively kind of minimal immune monitoring uh, panel. Of course, you wanted to know, you know, does this apply to other markers as well? And even more generally, you know, what markers do the various cells express? Um, because we can only really use them as a reference control for, for proteins that they actually show some positive expression for. Um, and so we, to, to sort of address this question, we, we turned to a, a trick that we'd used earlier. So some of you may have seen a paper that we published uh, last year in Frontiers in Immunology, where we had uh, essentially used the Biologin legend screen coupled with a pretty convoluted barcoding strategy uh, to effectively screen the expression of over 300 different antibodies um, and evaluate their sensitivity to fixation. Um, and so uh, we have a kind of a nice sort of resource that shows you sort of which, uh, which markers are expressed on what cell type and essentially how does fixation uh, alter that. So we decided to use essentially the same strategy to evaluate the varicells. So we took a, a mixture of conventional varicells as well as tantalum-label varicells, uh, labeled them with kind of a core immune, immune phenotyping panel so we could identify major cell subsets, and then overlaid that with, uh, with BioLegend's Legend Screen Kit, which is essentially 332 PE-labeled antibodies, which we then detected with an anti-PE uh, metal-labeled antibody. Um, and the end result of this is a lot of data. So you can see here we have um, every, every row of this, this kind of triplicate heat map represents a different antibody, uh, and the columns are, are different cell subsets. So just like zooming into a section of this here, you can see, for example, that we have uh, a range of detected cell subsets across the bottom here. Um, and then for each of those subsets, we have whether or not the marker is detected uh, and the proportion of cells that are positive for that marker. Um, and so this kind of acts as like a nice reference guide that we can use to evaluate you know, which markers the varicells can and cannot effectively be used to QC. Uh, so looking at this, for example, uh, CD34 is probably not a marker that you'd want to use the varicells to QC for because while it's expressed, it's expressed at very low frequency, and so you're unlikely to have a very effective uh, positive population. Whereas contrasting that with something like CD35, um, this would you know, have a nice reference here where you could use the expression on B cells and the varicells as a, as a positive control for the marker uh, while using the expression on, for example, T cells as an internal negative control uh, for the presence of that marker. Uh, and what's nice is that if we evaluate the relative expression of all of these different antibodies on the metal-labeled varicells uh, versus just conventional varicells, we see quite a good correlation. The R-squared is about uh, 0.96, I think. Um, so you know, generally speaking, uh, you can treat these as though they were conventional varicells, just with the convenience of having the metal label uh, in them. So what we overall envision here then is we have uh, a range of, of con internal controls that can be used to QC the data and evaluate variability. Uh, there's the EQ beads as detectable by serum 140, which can be used to detect instrument variation. And then within the biological sample, you have your tantalum positive varicells, which you can use to QC for essentially staining consistency in any deviations in antibody or experiment or sample matrix. Uh, and this allows the focus to now uh, be on true biological variation uh, at the level of the sample uh, itself. Uh, so I'm going to pass the mic back to a lot at this point uh, to talk a bit more about how he's using the Astrolabe diagnostics platform to be able to, to QC data uh, with the tantalum label parasols. Thank you, Adib. And I will now move from the realm of what are the very cells to how you can actually use them to improve the analysis of your site of data. And this goes back to a paper by Klein Struber et al. from 2016. In this study, they did not have the very cells. However, they did have a large batch of PBMC aliquots from a single healthy donor, which they then um, barcoded with CD45 barcoding and spiked into each one of their patients, into the patient samples. Uh, this was acquired using the CYTAF, and the, researcher, the researchers uh, later used this uh, spike in both uh, for quality control and to uh, refine their gating strategy. Now, the main advantage with the very cells is that they greatly simplify the process for you. You do not need to acquire um, a large batch from a single healthy subject, and you do not need to take care of the barcoding. Furthermore, as I did mention, um, while 181 can be detected by the CYTAF, it is not commonly used. So unlike this uh, 4 c 45 scheme, which might waste, so to speak, some of your channels, um, with the very cells, you, um, 
you get access to all of the channels you would otherwise. So a very easy and straightforward way to incorporate reference spike gains into your experiment. And of course, with um, all of these new samples comes a analytical and computational challenge. Let's say you have a pretty standard experiment with 20 patients and three time points. Usually, you would have 60 samples to analyze, 60 FCS files. However, now that each of these has a very cell spike in, or any other reference spike in, that number doubles. And you're now dealing with 120 samples that need to go through whichever analysis pipeline that you would like to use. This is where Astrolabe can um, come to your rescue. Astrolabe is a fully automated pipeline for the analysis of high complex defectometry data. Our goal is to get you from single cell data into meaningful biological insights as quickly as possible. Amongst others, the platform takes care of debar coding, cleaning the data, um, all of the uh, clinical features or outcomes, cell subset labeling, and uh, statistical analysis. In the context of the very cells, Astrolabe can help you with four different steps. The platform can automatically debar code the very cells. It can label cell subsets across all of the spike in samples. It can assess marker staining in positive populations and the platform will compile a report that will outline any suspicious signals in your very cell data. Let's go over these one by one. First of all, Astrolabe can automatically debar code the very cells. In fact, the platform can debar code any barcoding scheme that you have in mind, including combinations of barcoding schemes. So you can very easily add the uh, very cell TA181 um, barcoding kit and you can layer it on top of any other barcoding kit that you might have. So for example, in this experiment, we are instructing Astrolabe to debar code using the standard Fluidine barcoding kit, using the Palladium kit, and on top of that, to debar code the very cells using the 181 channel. Astrolabe, uh, Astrolabe tells us that um, the first scheme is gonna have 20 samples per file, and the second one is gonna have two for a total of 40 FCS files. Next up, Astrolabe can label the different cell subsets across your spikings and across all of the other experiment samples as well. So to your left, you see a heat map with the marker signature of each one of these major compartments in one of the very cell samples. Uh, you can see the B cells are CD19 positive, the T cells are CD3 positive, and so on. To the right, you see the Astrolabe assignment level, which further stratifies each of the major compartments into a variety of different cell subsets, such as naive B cells, memory B cells, uh, different types of T cells, and so on and so forth. Then, Astrolabe generates a report that lets you easily assess the staining quality um, of each one of your markers across all of the very cell spike ends in the positive populations. So in this example, we have four samples denoted B1 to B4, and we're looking just at the ref at the very cell uh, spike ends in each one of them. Uh, each of these violin plots is showing us one marker and the expression of that marker only in the cells which are positive for it. This allows us to quickly see whether there's any staining issues or even missing markers. In this case, we can see that across the four very cell samples, the staining of all of these markers is pretty constant. And for this last section, I want to introduce the reference spike in summary report that Estrelay produces. And for this, I'm going to use a dataset that was acquired by Adib. Um, here we have a single healthy donor PBMC that uh, was spiked with uh, the very cells. Then, uh, this, uh, this, sam this sample was stained with a core panel that targets the major compartments in the immune system with some resolution for T cells and B cells. On top of that, we artificially introduced staining variability by adding three markers, CD64, 11C, and 11B, for which we had four different levels. So the samples were split into four, 
B1 had the lowest level of each of these markers, B4 had the highest uh, level of each of these markers. All of this data was then analyzed using the S2A platform. As I mentioned before, s 2 debug calls the data, identifies cell subsets, and then takes just a spied reference spike in the very cell samples for the summary report. One part of this report is the heat map that you see here, and this heat map includes the staining score of each one of the markers. The rows are the different very cell samples, and the columns are each one of the markers. The staining score uh, is using the positive population for the given marker in every sample and it's calculating the mean and the standard deviation of that sample to the overall mean and standard deviation across all of the various cell samples. Since all of these are the same, we're expecting this to be constant. However, for any sample where the mean is lower than the one expected from the overall population, we will have a higher standing score. So a standing score of zero means no issues. The higher it is, the more problematic it is. And I mentioned before that three of the markers here were, um, were titrated to create artificial variability, CD11B, CD11C, and CD64, and all three of these are highlighted in this map. I'm going to focus just on CD64 since it has the highest signal. We can go back to the type of figure that we've seen before where we see the, um, the intensity of this marker in all of the cells that belong to the positive peak. And we can quickly see the titration uh, that we introduced. And finally, we can take this information and use it to validate whether there's an issue with data. In this case, I just use Flojo, and um, I looked at the four very cell samples um, at the level of CD64, in this case versus CD3, and you can see how the, um, the expression of the marker goes up. Finally, I want to make sure that this is not just a very cell issue. So, I've also gone to the donor samples in this data and again validated them to make sure that um, the same trend that we see with the very cell also exists here. So you acquire your data, you spike in the very cells, and then Astrolab takes care of all the steps of analyzing the experiment, including generating this heat map that allows you to assess the quality of the staining across the reference spikings with just a quick single look. What about larger studies? So in the previous slide, I've shown you a heat map with four reference spikings, which corresponds to four samples. Um, we've taken the same approach and applied it to a larger study. This is a study that involves an infectious disease. This data has not been published yet, so I'm going to hide most of the information about the, uh, the experiment itself. However, I can tell you that this involved 90 patients and two time points per patient for a total of 180 samples. Same calculation as did before, we have a reference spike in each one of these samples which gives us a total of 360 samples. And of course, you're always welcome to analyze these things yourself. However, plugging that many samples into something like Cytofkit, um, or even some of the commercials platform available out there, might be challenging. As with the smaller experiment, we took this data and we put it on Astrolab. Astrolab took care of the debug coding, of the cleaning, and um, of all the uh, analysis and quality control. And here I'm showing you another figure that is available as part of the Astrolabe report. In this figure, the x-axis is all of the samples, all of the very cell samples um, in this study, and um, the, um, the value for each one, which I refer to here as quality, is the maximum value from the heat map that we've seen before. So just taking a quick look at the heat map again, you see that most of these are white, which means that there's no standing issues and the maximum is going to be zero. However, in this experiment, we see that um, while most of the samples are fine, a few of them have an intermediate quality uh, score, which might allude to some standing issue, and then several of them have a pretty high quality score, which is a pretty strong red flag. At this point, I will mention that these samples were acquired over nine batches. Batch one is at the bottom, batch nine is at the top, and it looks like batch eight had the highest quality score. So looking at the heat map, just for this batch,
we see that the uh, the score is uh, is high for quite a few markers, and it is highest for CXCR3 and CD40. So once again, I've gone to the single cells, I opened these files in Flojo, and I looked at CD3 versus CXCR3, and we can see that for batch 8, there is just no staining for this marker. I have no idea what happened. At this point, you might want to go back to the bench and figure out what went wrong. However, um, the fact that you included the reference spikings, the fact that you analyzed this and generated the report using Astrolabe, allows you to identify this trend as quickly as possible. And now I have a small confession to make. Um, when Adib and I were working on these slides, we knew that CXCR3 is missing from batch 8. This is a data set that Adib has already analyzed, he has already flagged this issue. So the goal was really to see that we can reproduce a theme that we already identified. However, as far as I know, and Adib could correct me if I'm wrong, um, he was unaware of any staining issues in CD40. And in fact, it looks like um, CD40 might be missing from uh, the, this batch as well. All of which to say that there is a lot of power to be gained by this kind of unbiased analysis. Um, you include the very cells, it's very straightforward, it's very easy, and then by using these kinds of visualizations that really allow you to browse through tens or hundreds of samples very easily, you can identify any kind of staining issues that could jeopardize any downstream analysis that you want to do. So a quick summary of the benefits of combining uh, the Vericell reference spikings and Astrolabe. First of all, the Vericells are an easy method to incorporate quality control via reference spikings. Again, you can go down the route of getting your own healthy PBMCs and tagging them uh, with, let's say, CD45 barcoding. Or, if you want to save the time, if you want to save the effort, you can just take the very cells and gain all the benefits that Adib mentioned. For example, the fact that we fully profile them using Legend Screen. For example, the fact that even you acquire one batch now and one batch in a year, you know that they should be comparable. Then, Astrolabe layers a fully standardized, unbiased, and automated analysis on top of your experiment. Part of this analysis is taking care of everything else you might do with your side of data. Debar coding, cleaning, cell subset labeling, and the follow-up analysis. For the purpose of this webinar, I focused on the kind of quality control that Astrolabe offers when you use reference spikings. Both of these elements are modular. You can use very cells with any kind of analysis other than Astrolabe, and you can use Astrolabe with any kind of reference spikings, not just very cell, very cells. One last thing I want to mention in the context of Astrolabe is the significant saving of analysis time. So the legend screen study that uh, Adib mentioned has about 700 samples. Astrolabe analyzed the whole thing in a bit over three hours. Again, the barcoding, cell subset labeling, and so on and so forth. For the infectious disease study, which has over 300 samples, the analysis took a little bit less than three hours and compare this to the amount of time you would need to spend, um, let's say, clustering the data, annotating the clusters, going to a biostatistician or doing your own statistics, generating visualizations, sharing the data with your PI or with collaborators, um, I think that you will agree that there is quite a lot of savings to be had by using the platform. So with this, I will turn to you, the audience. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button below. Uh, just enter your question, and Adib and I will try to uh, get to many of these as possible. Uh, we're going to take a break for a few seconds, just so I can review the questions. And um, then um, we're going to start addressing whatever you guys want to know. Thank you for your time. Okay, so first of all, apologies for the uh, large background uh, noise on the recording. Hopefully that is resolved now. And uh, Adib, are you still there? I am. Okay, great. So let's start with uh, some of the questions that people in the audience raised. Uh, the first one is, how long can very cells be stored frozen? And how long can they be stored in DMSO FBS freezing buffer? Um. Sure. I guess this would this be maybe a clarification, Darius. Are you referring to prior to staining or uh, or after staining? Because uh, I guess that would be 
somewhat somewhat variable. Um, so typically, I can say that we we generally use the varicells within a week of reconstituting a vial. Um, so we haven't done too much in terms of freezing varicells prior to, to using them. So the fact that they come lyophilized, in my mind, is sort of an advantage that precludes the need to sort of re rebank them. Um, so at least in at four degrees for about a week, uh, we've seen them be fairly stable. We haven't really tested too much longer than that. Um, after they've been stained, uh, we've, we've certainly had samples where we spiked varicells in, uh, and those samples have been stored at minus 80 for, uh, for several months, and they seem to be fine. And of course, the, uh, the varicells themselves <clears throat> are lyophilized. So until you reconstitute, mm -hmm. you can store them pretty much indefinitely, I guess. Yep. And I guess we didn't show it here, but we've actually done a bunch of testing to show they're actually quite temperature stable as well. So you can kind of take the varicells and, and leave them uh, in a hot car for a while, um, <laughs> which we approximated with a, a 45 degree incubator. Uh, and, uh, and they seem to be fine. But you did not actually put them in a hot car. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is, how many varicell minimum need to be spiked in for robust QC metrics? And uh, I actually took a quick look at Astrolabe to see the uh, statistics for the Legend Scream experiment. And here we have a few thousand uh, cells per uh, sample. I would say that is pretty consistent with the other experiments as well. I think somewhere between five and 10,000 should be enough for your quality control needs. Uh, Adib, any, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, it depends a little bit, obviously, also, because the, the thing with the varicells is they are um, a heterogeneous uh, mixture of cells. And so if you are trying to use the PDC subset of varicells as a reference control, you're probably going to need to acquire more than if you are using CD4 T cells, for example, as the, as the population of, of reference interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, Darius is asking, um, would you recommend spiking in varicells before or after barcoding? Uh, personally, I think the answer is before barcoding, mm -hmm. that way you can assess the barcoding as well for the very cells. Yep, yeah, we put them in kind of at the at the very start uh, of our stain um, so that they're essentially present for kind of the entirety of the study. Um, I, I guess one option, if you are barcoding a large number of samples anyway, so we, we do have another study where we have, let's say, um, you know, 20 samples that we're, we're gonna be barcoding using a, you know, a CD45 based barcode prior to the start of staining. And in that scenario, we actually have added the varicells uh, as, um, as a component for the entire pool. Because since those 20 samples are already being pooled together, it seems sort of redundant for have each of them having kind of their own varicell. So in that case, we have the varicell as a control for the entire batch. Hopefully that makes sense. Right. So there's several questions. So in this, in this presentation, we focused on surface markers. There are several questions about activation markers, phosphor markers, stimulations, Mm -hmm. um, cytoplasmic markers and nuclear markers. So lots of different markers. Um, Adib, could you, could you cover sure. these? Uh, yeah, so I, guess the, um, so I guess the key thing to recognize about the varicells is that they are, in of themselves, they're, they're essentially fixed lyophilized cells. So you can't do anything to them. Like you can't induce expression of an activation marker. Uh, that being said, you can create varicells out of uh, any cell type, um, or I guess BioLegend can, and you can commission these. So I had a slide which I actually didn't include uh, for the sake of time, but we've actually done some work with BioLegend to also come up with uh, a multi-metal labeled variety of the varicells where different populations there have been exposed to different stimuli. So that way you have kind of a, an internal reference control for, for example, an interfering gamma positive population or an interfering gamma negative population. Um, so it's possible to do, it's, it does uh, require sort of purchasing a product to do so. You can't kind of take the varicells and do that yourself. Um, the resting varicells do seem to be positive for, um, we've, we've stained them for Tibet, I think, as a transcription factor, and that worked. Uh, and then the activated varicells, uh, we've stained for a range of different um, cytokines, and, and those have worked as well. I don't believe we've tested any phospho-staining yet, but I would imagine that would probably work uh, as well. Okay. Um, so a question about Astrolabe, is Astrolabe a cloud-based software similar to Cytobank? Uh, yes, Astrolabe is a cloud-based software. However, we are quite dissimilar from Cytobank. Um, Cytobank, I usually, usually refer to it as the Swiss army knife of, uh, of flow and mass cytometry. It's a large collection of algorithms that you can apply. Astrolabe is more of a bioinformatics service. So um, you can upload your samples, you can explain your experiment design, and Astrolabe takes the role of the biostatistician. 
the platform does everything automatically. Um, we're following state-of-the-art guidelines and state-of-the-art algorithms when analyzing your data. And um, I encourage you to check our website, astrolabdiagnostic.com, uh, for more information. So the next question is, um, I am planning a large longitudinal study and I want to use various cells. How can I make sure I have various cells from the same batch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess the, the key is yeah, we, we've been in the same boat uh, several times. And so this one is a little bit, it's a little bit on BioLegend. But what we've, what we've done in that instance is we've commissioned uh, a single batch of, so essentially we plan how large the overall study is going to be. Uh, the, the one I'm referring to was a, a 600 plus sample study that was uh, going to last several years. Um, and so we contacted them and uh, ensured that we could buy that entire batch of varicels up front uh, and could be formulated at one time so that we had a consistent batch for the whole study. Um, because it is, it is true that, you know, these are being derived from biological samples. So I, I wouldn't assume that you could necessarily go back to BioLegend uh, three years from now and expect that the, the lot of varicels there will match the one that you start with. Uh, so if that is a plan, um, I would plan to kind of stockpile at the start of the study. Yeah, and um, these are pretty cheap and shouldn't really expire ever. So yeah. you should be able to just buy a ridiculously large amount of them <laughs> and keeping them in a hot car um, <laughs> until you're ready to use them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is, um, if using a very cell spiking reference approach, you notice a significant staining variation, how do you go about adjusting for it? And um, I think this question alludes at potential batch effects that uh, are part of any biological study, biology study, whether it's flow cytometry, mass cytometry, or other, um, other essays. And um, it is a pretty complex question. Uh, there are tools for normalizing mass cytometry out there. Um, for example, Sophie Van Gessen, um, who's a developer behind Flowsome, recently published a method called Cytonorm. And you should be able to use the very cells as the reference spikings for these normalization methods. However, um, I would advise uh, caution uh, for, uh, for several reasons. One, um, when you do normalize, you manipulate the data. And in general, we're trying to minimize the number of manipulations that we do before actually doing any kind of analysis. Um, the second problem, and um, Adib has some unpublished data for this, we have seen situations where the shift in the signal due to a batch effect actually differs between, um, between cell subsets and potentially between patients. In other words, there might be a masking biological factor that influences the magnitude of the batch effect. And if you use the same, um, the same parameters and the same references for all of the normalizations, then um, you might lead to, you might create artifacts. Um, the approach that I've been recommending, and we actually have a video about this, you're welcome to check it on our YouTube channel, is to use a combination of clustering and metaclustering. And this is a method that has been utilized in multiple studies, uh, both from Sinai and elsewhere, where you go sample by sample and you cluster them. And then in order to line up the clusters between the different samples, you use metaclustering. And in this case, even if you have batch effects, um, then since you're treating each sample separately, you should still get the, the phenotypes you're looking for. And then the metaclustering is gonna take care of adjusting for the batch effects. Um, of course, there is limitations to any method using the examples here. If CXCR3 is missing from a sample, it's just missing, uh, it's not gonna come back. And finally, I will point out that Astrolabe is using this method I mentioned of clustering and metaclustering. Um, so if you do have an experiment which you suspect has potential batch effects, you're welcome to reach out to us and we'll do our best to analyze it and help. Um, Adib, any other comments about uh, normalization and uh, changes in standing variation? Nope, I, I uh, agree with what you just said. Yeah, my, my general philosophy for, for most spike in references is you, you can potentially try and, and normalize your data. It's a, you know, it's a valid computational thing to attempt, but, but I think the utility really there is to determine whether or whether you should not use a sample for analysis, um, which ends up being, you know, I guess something that needs to, you need to make kind of a subjective decision on. One thing that um, I, I like to do, 
is, you know, obviously the goal of all these mass spectrometry studies is to identify some sort of known biology. Uh, and so one of the things that's helpful is to, to run the analysis you plan to, to, to do, uh, you know, get the insight that you hope you're going to get. So, you know, you compare phenotype A to phenotype or, you know, genotype A to genotype B and see if you see a difference. Um, but then once you have that result, regress it against the QC metric to see if a significant amount of the variation that you're seeing that you're attributing to biology is actually coming from, um, from testinal variation which should then give you pause in terms of whether that conclusion is valid. So I think it's helpful to, to add it as a potential kind of batch QC corrector um, in the context of the actual biological insight as opposed to the marker itself. That's a great point. And um, you can use the data to normalize the signal itself, the intensity of the markers, or you can go to the statistics and use it to normalize the statistical signal, so to speak. Correct. Um, which I think is, is a potentially less fraught thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at least for that, we have like decades of statistical right. literature that we can rely on. Um, you mentioned that you generated the reference data set for Vericells. Is this data set publicly available? Uh, not yet, but uh, we are planning to publish it as soon as possible. Um, I think that for the time being, if you want to just email us, do you think that's going to be okay? Yeah, I'm happy to share with people, but yeah, we're, we're planning to have this uh, certainly out on BioArchive pretty soon, and we'll make the data public as soon as it goes on BioArchive. Um, so fingers crossed, it shouldn't be too long. Yeah, and for the time being, if you really need it right now, just, just email us and um, we can share the Astrolab experiment and it has all the data in it. Um, I assume the ratio of control in experimental cells is one to one, or is it another oh. ratio recommended? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, no, no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, we, we do a lot, yeah, we do a lot on that, yeah. So, so that you don't want to waste, so the limitation obviously of a spike in control is that you're wasting some of your acquisition bandwidth um, on, on that, you know, if the site off was, uh, 100 times faster, that would be trivial, but since it's not, you, you kind of don't want to make sure you're spending a lot of instrument time uh, acquiring a reference. So you, you pretty much want the smallest number of cells that's going to allow you to see that kind of, you know, positive and negative control staining. We typically aim for about 10% uh, of the sample, 5 to 10% of the sample is what we usually do. Yeah, and um, again, going back to the, the different studies that, uh, that we analyzed with Estrelab, I think 5 to 10K is, is probably enough. Um, I did mention that varicells resemble formaldehyde fixed PBMCs. Is this for both conventional varicells and meta-labeled varicells, or only one of them? Uh, both. Both. Yeah. Um, are varicells stable in methanol for a few weeks? Uh, I expect they should be. We've, yeah, we've tested for a few days, but I, I don't see any reason why longer wouldn't work. Did you see any... Um, any diminishing signal over a few days or did it remain constant? Uh, over three days, they were identical. We saw no difference at all. Okay. And uh, one last question. Uh, would you recommend using varicells as a carrier sample for low sample numbers or is it better to find a healthy donor as a carrier? Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've done it. We've, we've used them as a carrier for, um, um, for a low sample. Uh, so they, they work. I guess I don't have a strong opinion as to whether you'd want to use these versus um, kind of, you know, some other PBMC or something like that. Uh, but that's certainly something you could do with them. Yeah, and um, I would add an asterisk of it depends because mm -hmm. I could see many situations where you would prefer a healthy donor. Mm -hmm. Basic example, if your tissue is not PBMCs, <laughs> then getting um, a healthy, no, you don't think so? I guess the, the key, uh, so the, the goal for a carrier sample typically is it's just bulking essentially, right? You're adding additional cells to the sample that you, um, that you can then sort of, they're essentially there to assist with pelleting and minimize cell losses during centrifugation, but you really mm -hmm. don't care about them for the purpose of analysis. So it's sort of a different utilization of them. Uh, so in some ways they, they should be fine for that because if you kind of ignore them, you can just gate them out of your experiment based on tantalum. So Theoretically, it's a way that you could still do like a very large uh, phenotyping panel, uh, and then you have this one extra channel you could use to essentially eliminate the stuff that you didn't care about to begin with. Um, so in some ways, that makes sense. Uh, if you actually want to use them to QC marker expression, then obviously it should be somewhat relevant to the, the sample of interest that you're, that you're interested in. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so I think that's all the questions. Um, so I'm going to thank all of you for attending again. I'm going to thank Biolegend for their help in organizing. Um, thank you, Adib, for, uh, for the uh, wonderful content and for answering the questions.
If you have any questions about the very cells, please reach out to Biolegend or to Adib. Um, any questions about analysis, either of reference spike ins or analysis in general, please reach out to me at Astrolabe Diagnostics. Uh, finally, please subscribe to our YouTube channels. Uh, we're going to put this video there and many other videos about immune monitoring. Uh, so thank you, Adib, and have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.